Just a uh, short introduction for some of you that have not met Dr. Sandoval. He has, he's an MD, a doctor with his degree from Loma Linda University, and he's board certified in emergency room and lifestyle medicine. So uh, a couple of uh, areas of background which broadens his experience and, and understanding. Um, when he went as a missionary to Trinidad and Tobago, it really um, perked his interest in uh, health education. And since that time, God has just laid a burden on him and used him in a very special way. He went from the mission service to what's called Uchi Pines Institute. Some of you may have heard that. It's in Alabama. And he was the medical director there at that um, Lifestyle Institute. And he's also the director of health ministries for what's called the Gulf States Conference. That's an organization of Seventh-day Adventist churches. And he serves as the uh, health director. So he has lots of hats that he wears. And plus, he just started a new ministry called Paradigm. What's it called? The yeah, New Paradigm Ministry. So you'll be hearing more about that too. Also, I just want you to know that Dr. Mark will be having a question and answer session before each seminar. Not tonight. Uh, you, so if you're wondering whether you missed that, no, you didn't miss it. But each night, starting at 5, 5.30. So from 5.30 to 6.30, if you have questions, you just bring them with you. Uh, and he will take them from the floor as, as you gather. Then, also, if you would like to have some personal time with Dr. Sandoval, uh, in terms of what would it be, Dr. Sandoval? Counsel counseling or health consultation? Counseling, health consultation. He has set aside uh, three sessions, to five sessions a day, I believe. Three. Three, okay. Hour so. And a half. I have the sign-up sheet in the back, and if you would like to, to do that, you come to me, and we will sign you up for tomorrow and Monday. And then uh, on Monday night, we'll sign up for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever it goes. Actually, there's no meeting on Wednesday. So anyway, glad you're here. I'd like to invite us to pause for a moment and ask for God's blessing as we begin. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege we have of gathering together and for the um, wisdom and insight that you give us by your spirit, in your word, and uh, I pray that you'll bless Dr. Sandoval this evening. You have prepared him for this moment. You've given him instruction, guidance, wisdom. He studied hard, and now he's going to, to give to us important a direction and and truths. So bless us as we hear and listen. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure again to be here with you and uh, get to see some new faces. A few people that I know already. It's nice to have Dan Gabbert in the in the uh, the audience. I should. I wish I was here last week and I could have been at your series over at State Line. I. I love sitting at that man's feet. He's a, a godly man and a, and a wonderful ministry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and to be able to share. And we are going to be talking about health, but we're going to be talking about health in a number of different ways. Um, and we're going to approach it uh, quite a bit differently than usually health is approached, because we're not going to talk about what kind of salad you should be eating and uh, what kind of food you shouldn't be eating or how much you should be exercising or so on, um, because we want to understand really what are the foundations of health. We want to understand why individuals get ill and how they can get well. Uh, I have had the privilege of working in a lifestyle center and traveling many locations and treating many individuals, uh, some of whom are very confounded as to why they're ill because they have a good lifestyle and they're on a plant-based diet and they exercise and they still come down with cancer. And they're, they're, they're just wondering, how, how come me? Or they might be a health ministries director for their church and they're the pinnacle of lifestyle 
and they're sick. And their life is just spiraling at this point because they're wondering why, why me? Why, why is this happening? You know, shouldn't a healthy lifestyle prevent these things from happening? Well, the answer is a healthy lifestyle is not the only thing. And there's a reason why people have a healthy lifestyle and there's a reason why people don't have a healthy lifestyle. And we've got to get down to the reasons. We've got to get to the roots of it. So as we consider this, I like to use analogies. I like to use stories. And so we're going to look at the analogy of a tree uh, as we begin. And so, of course, here we have a tree. Um, when you think of trees and you walk up to a tree, what's the first thing that you notice? Okay, if it's a fruit tree and it's bearing season, then the fruit, um, you've got a number of trees that are bearing right now or are getting towards the end of that, uh, that season. Now, what else do you notice? All right, the leaves, the foliage, right? All right, the, the bark, uh, the general shape of the tree. What do you usually not notice about the tree? The roots, right? Because they're buried usually, unless you have some of those uh, odd varieties where the roots come down from the branches and, and then you pay a lot of attention to the roots, at least the ones that are above ground. So when we're looking at the tree, the fruit and the leaves represent our symptoms, right? So if you have some bad fruit and bad leaves on your tree, well, that represents symptoms. It's things like pain and coughing and itching and runny nose and sore throat and other things like that, which, you know, you know you got a problem because you're feeling it. And so it's the obvious stuff. Now, if you have symptoms, what do we usually do? Okay, so we treat the symptoms. And how do we usually treat the symptoms? Okay, so usually there's a pill for every ill. And that might be true in the pharmacy, but it's also true in the health food store. So you might have a supplement or an herbal remedy for every ill and you run to that, you know, you might run to your, your oils or you might run to your supplements or you might run to your teas or you might run to this or you might run to your, uh, your medicine cabinet or the pharmacy and you have a pill for every ill and in fact there are multiple pills for every ill so that if one doesn't work you can take two and if two don't work then you can take three and so on. If you have a tree that has bad fruit and bad leaves, does it fix the problem to pluck off the bad fruit and bad leaves? No, it doesn't fix the problem. Now, it might decrease the burden of disease or the manifestation of the problem, but it doesn't actually fix the problem itself. Let's imagine that you have back pain and it's a stabbing pain and it's right there between your shoulder blades. And it's just aching and you can't lay on your back and, and, uh, and it's just, it's excruciating. And so what do you do? Well, let's say that you've taken over-the-counter pain medication and, you know, it, it's a little better, but it's still really bad and you can't lay on your back. And, and so you go in to see your doctor and your doctor says, okay, well, let's give you this prescription. And so you take this prescription and, you, of course, you keep taking the over-the-counter the medication too and, and the prescription. And so you're taking both and it's getting a little better, um, but it's still very painful, very uncomfortable. You go back to your doctor and they say, well, here, we'll give you a stronger pain medication, and you get that stronger pain medication, and it's still problematic. You still can't lay on your back. And so what do you do? Go get a second opinion. And you go see the second opinion, and they actually happen to do a physical exam, and they look at you, and they realize, <laughs> there's a reason you've got pain in your back. Right? So did the pill take care of the problem? No, the pill didn't take care of the problem. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to treat the symptoms. I, I don't want to get that, you know, give that idea away. I mean, if somebody stabbed me in the back, praise the Lord, there's pain medication. While we're in the process of healing, but don't do it without taking care of the cause, right? We got to get to the cause. And so the, the, the symptoms, symptoms are like fire alarms. Anybody like a fire alarm? No, do you like it when it's going off? No, <laughs> okay, we're getting mixed results because we're thinking of two sides of the issue, yes. Is it a good thing, is it a good thing to have to have a fire alarm? No, it's not a good thing to have to have a fire alarm. But if you have to have a fire alarm, is it a good thing to have a fire alarm? Yes. Because the fire alarm is not the problem. 
The problem is the fire, right? The fire alarm is just alerting you to the fact that there is a problem. So if you have a fire that's going on and the fire alarm is going off, now a fire alarm is designed intentionally to be annoying, right? Annoying so that you won't sleep through the thing that's very dangerous, which is the fire, because fires are quiet, right? Fires don't get very loud, except the stuff that they're burning. Sometimes might go poof, or you know, the wood crackles or other things pop here and there, but fire itself, it's pretty quiet, so you can sleep through it. So it's annoying on purpose in order to wake you up that there's a problem. So what if your solution to the annoying fire alarm is to put a pillow over the fire alarm? And let's tape it down so that it stays there. Is that a good solution? No, no right? That's not a good solution at all. So if you've got symptoms, it's not a good thing to just treat the symptoms and not look for the cause. We need to be looking for the cause. Now. The, the fruit and the leaves, they don't grow by themselves. They grow on the, the branches. That's right. And the branches represent our behaviors. Right? So if you have good branches, are those going to support good fruit? Yeah. yeah. And if you have bad branches, is that going to support bad fruit? Yeah. yeah. So it, branches are important. Behaviors are important. And there are very simple behaviors that we have. Things like breathing and drinking and eating and so on. Right? How many people do those things? All right, good, because if you don't, you shouldn't be here. Um, and uh, you're a ghost or something, right? So we all have these behaviors. They're all things that we do. And if those behaviors are good, then it's going to support good fruit and good leaves. And if those behaviors are bad, then it's going to support bad fruit and bad leaves. Make sense? All right. So if, we, if we've got symptoms, well, we can just do the regular treating symptoms, or we can get deeper, and we can work on the behaviors. And that's the jump that I made. I mean, I did emergency medicine, and then while I was in Trinidad, I was doing emergency medicine and family medicine and ICU and hospitalist work and, and, and so on. And, and I had patients that were coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, and I'm still treating the diabetes and the hypertension, and I'm giving them this medication, and I'm giving them that one, and then I'm increasing the dose here, and, and so on. But they keep coming back, and they still have the same problem. I'm like, hang on, I did not go into medicine to do this, I went into medicine to help people, all right? But I'm not helping them because they're not getting any better. And all I'm doing is dosing them more and more, and they're getting worse and worse while I'm doing so. Something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. And so I became interested in, all right, let's get deeper. So then I moved to Uchi Pines so I could learn from Dr. Agatha Thrash and, you know, how to do lifestyle and natural remedies and, and get a bit deeper. And so then I had the experience of working in the lifestyle center and, uh, you know, physicians are pre pretty much practically skeptical. We're, we're raised as skeptics, you know, and, uh, and so we're skeptical of anything else. And so even though I was going, I was still skeptical. And, and I wasn't sure about these natural remedies. I mean, this is emergency. This is real deal stuff that these patients have in the lifestyle center. And you're going to give them what? <laughs> that just doesn't seem like it's going to work. But as I was there, I watched them. I saw them improve. And, and uh, you know, a few sessions of, of seeing, you know, people improving and doing such simple things. And I was like, wow, maybe this really does work. All right, this is great. And so, you know, I'm working and I have my own patients and, and, and so on. But then I start to realize, hang on, there's still a problem. Right? There's still a problem. Sometimes I, I, I greet our, our, our patients, our guests at the Lifestyle Center. I say, well, welcome to your behavioral correctional facility. <laughs> right? Because that's what a Lifestyle Center is, isn't it? It's a behavioral corrections facility. And we're off in the middle of nowhere. So if they want to go somewhere, they got to walk a long ways. <laughs> now, we don't lock their door. They can lock their own door, but you know. Um, and uh, sometimes we do have them fast, and uh, they endure. And, and, and anyways, but you got to get deeper, because it's deeper than just that. Because people do what they do for a reason. And you've got to get to the reason. you got to get to the reason. Now, the branches don't grow by themselves. What do the branches grow on? 
the trunk. And the trunk represents our needs. Anybody have any needs? We well, sure, yeah. I mean, we need oxygen. We need water. We need food, right? So we have very basic needs that everybody has. And you can't just change the fact that you have those needs. Anybody here want to just decide you don't need oxygen anymore? We'll all watch and see how well that goes. It's not going to go very well, right? So you can't change what you need because what you need is based upon what you are. And you are a human being, and so a human being needs oxygen, and it needs water, and it needs food, and, and so on. Now, everything that you need, the thing you need comes from where? Inside of you or outside of you? Outside, right? Everything you need comes from outside of you, and does it do you any good if it stays outside of you? No, it only does you good if it comes in, right? Only does good if it comes in. So whose responsibility is it to bring it in? It's your own, right? So if you're suffocating over there, well, is it going to help you if I go <laughs> over here? No, it's not going to help at all. Now, I'll hyperventilate and get lightheaded, and you'll die from not breathing over there, and neither of us are going to be helped by that situation. If you need oxygen, you've got to breathe, right? That's why we have these behaviors. You breathe because you need oxygen. You drink because you need water. You eat because you need food. The behaviors are there in order to supply the need. And if your behaviors match your needs, then you're going to end up with good fruit and good leaves. But if your behaviors don't match your needs, you're going to end up with bad fruit and bad leaves. Make sense? Right? So, you can't change what you need, it's fixed. So if you've ever been on a teeter-totter and had those fun games where you try to see who's going to you know, knock who off the other side, well, there's that point on the teeter-totter that doesn't move. That's the fulcrum. Right? And the fulcrum stays still. Everything balances around that. you know. And, and that fulcrum, when it comes to us, is our needs. It's the unchangeable point. You can't change what you need. So if you're going to have balance, everything else needs to move around that point in order for you to come into balance. So that means that behaviors are going to have to change to meet the needs if they're not meeting it currently in order for you to have good fruit and good leaves. Otherwise, you're going to end up with bad fruit and bad leaves. So oxygen is outside of you. What if oxygen stayed right at your nose? Would you live or die? You'll die, right? So in order for you to live, you have to bring it in so that it becomes a part of you. And only when it comes in and becomes a part of you can you live by that thing you need. Water is outside of you as well, but if it stays right there at your lips, are you going to live or die? You're going to die. So you've got to drink, you've got to bring it in, because only then when it comes into you and becomes a part of you, then you can live. Everything that you need, it doesn't matter even if it's close to you. You'll still die. You'll only live if it comes in. You'll only live if it comes in. <clears throat> so you need oxygen, but it doesn't just blow into you. You've got to breathe. And you need water, but it doesn't just squirt into you. You've got to drink. And you need food, and it's not just going to crawl down your throat. Well, you hope not. Sometimes it does. <clears throat> Especially if it stayed on the counter too long. But uh, you must. you got to eat. right? you got to eat. So everything must first take what it needs, right? and it must bring it in. But... What you do after that is you have to give it away. You have to give it away. Can you imagine how much you would weigh if you kept every bite of food you ever ate? I mean, just calculate the last week. How much would have you grown over the last week? How much do you eat at a meal? Do you eat a, you know, a pound of food, a pound and a half of food, two pounds of food, five pounds on a good day? I mean, a really good meal, you know, one of those ones where you went to potluck and you got lucky and you roll away from the table, you know. Um, 
So, so I mean, we would be huge. We would be so huge. And if you take, if you kept every drink of water that you ever, or anything that you drank, what if you kept in every bit of air that you breathe? It'd be like one of those hot air balloons that are going off out there. <laughs> Bigger than that. No, how, we take just a little, right? But we got to take it in. But we take just a little and we pass everything else along. And something else takes from what we pass along and it lives off of that. And something takes off of what lives from that and so on and so forth. Everything takes, it's gotta bring it in and then everything gives it along. That's how life works. Right? So does the trunk grow by itself? No, where does it grow from? It grows from the roots and the roots represent our beliefs. This is where we start getting, you know, you got to dig. How do you know what somebody believes? You got to go looking, right? You got to ask questions. You got to listen to them talk. You've got to spend time and, and, and seek to understand that. Why? Because most people don't even know what they believe. But do you, you want to know a way that you can know how, what someone believes? A sure way of knowing what somebody believes. Yeah, by what they do. Because what you believe will drive how you behave. And if given the opportunity, if you believe you believe it, but you don't do it, you don't believe it. And if with given the opportunity, if you believe you don't believe it, but you do it, you believe it. Right? Because what you believe will manifest in what you do. So you can look up here to get an idea of what's going on down here. Now, let's imagine that you believe you need Dr. Pepper. What are you going to do? You're going to drink Dr. Pepper. But do you need Dr. Pepper? No. No, you don't need Dr. Pepper. That was a pretty resounding no. It's, there's probably one or two dissenters in the group saying, oh, no. Please don't touch my doctor. I'm, I use Dr. Pepper because that was my favorite soft drink when I was growing up. Um, so, uh, so do you need it? No, you don't need it. Can you live on it? Yes, you can live on it. Why? Because it does have what you need. Because most of Dr. Pepper has water and it's got a little bit of food, but then it's got some other stuff you don't need. And guess what happens when you take in what you don't need? Is it going to end up in good fruit and good leaves or bad fruit and bad leaves? Bad fruit and bad leaves, right? So if your beliefs do not line up with your needs, your behaviors are not going to supply what you need, and you're going to end up with bad fruit and bad leaves. The only way you're going to end up with good fruit and good leaves is if your beliefs match your needs and your behaviors supply what you need, and then you'll end up with good fruit and good leaves. Now, it could be even good stuff or the things that you need that can get messed up too. Because if you believe that you need 15 gallons of water a day, what are you going to do? <laughs> You're going to try, at least, to drink 15 gallons of water a day. And if you succeed, you will kill yourself. Because you don't need that much water. Everything you need is in a certain quantity, a certain concentration, and a certain timing that you need as well. And so if your beliefs do not match with those needs, even if it's the thing you need, but it's too much or too little, then you're gonna end up with a behavior that's not supplying what you need, and you're gonna end up with bad fruit and bad leaves. Now, if you have a tree that has bad fruit and bad leaves, what part do you fix? All right, how many times have you seen somebody doing surgery on roots? I mean, yeah, if you've got a pot and that, you know, the, the, the plant is root bound in there, sure, you come and you rip and rip and so on, trying to get those, those roots free. Other than that, what do you do? Fertilizer. Oh, fertilizer. There you go. All right. Somebody who takes care of plants. So if the tree is going bad, what do you fix? You fix the soil. You fix the soil. Because the problem's not usually in the tree, it's in the soil. And the soil represents our sources. 
Right? Soil represents our sources, those things that we take from. Now, soil can have too little of what you need, arid environments, right? It can have too much of what you need, so it's waterlogged, or it can just have the wrong stuff. Oh, you mean this doesn't grow with diesel? Hmm. No, not so well. That does. So, you must have a good source that has what you need, then your beliefs must match your needs so that your behaviors provide what you need, and then you'll end up with good fruit and good leaves. Got it? All right, not too confusing, is it? All right, is there anybody here that does not need love? Anybody here that does not need love? All right, good, we're still 100%. Now, I've asked that question in many countries to hundreds of audiences, and except for two 14-year-old male children, one at one location and one in another location that raised their hand because they had a need of attention, which is a need for love. Uh, everybody else agrees they need love, right? So we need love as well. Now, according to everything we've looked at so far, the thing you need comes from where? Inside of you or outside of you? Outside of you, right? So the love you need comes where? From where? Outside, right? And it could be close to you, but you'll still die. Because what you need will never do you good until it comes in, right? It comes in and becomes a part of you. So you could have love close and die because it will do you no good unless it comes in. Now, whose responsibility is it to bring it in? Oh, really? Yes, it's true. It's our own responsibility to bring it in. So if you ever end up empty, why is it? Either it's not available or you're not bringing it in. You need oxygen, so you breathe. You need water, so you drink. You need food, so you eat. You need love, so you... Okay, I heard it. I won't pick on anybody, but I heard it. You need love, so you love. And I'm going to go back. Let's look at this. You need oxygen, so you oxygen. You need water, so you water. You need food, so you food. Okay. All right. You need oxygen, so you give away oxygen. You need uh, water, so you give away water. You need food, so you give away food. Does it work that way? No, it doesn't work that way. Why do we think it works that way with love? Hmm. Yes, because we've been taught things, and we've been taught things that are wrong. Right? It just, it can't work. And we get frustrated because we try to make it work, and it doesn't work. Why? Because it's an illusion. It's a deception. We gotta, we gotta get these things straight. Now, all right, here's an illustration. How do you take in love? Imagine you're having a bad day, and um, you come home and you check the mail and you know, bill, bill, lawyer, yeah, other things like that, and you have one letter in there, and oh, hang on, handwritten, oh, you recognize who the individual is, it's the right person, and you, you start, you know, you open it up, and they say, hi, you know, dear so-and-so, yeah, I can't, I'm, I'm still thinking of the last time that we were together and can't get you off my mind and, and I'm looking forward to the next time we get to, you know, spend time together and, and so on and, and love so-and-so, XOXO, and so on at the end. How do you feel when you get done with the letter? Oh, yeah, you feel it good. Do you feel loved? Yeah. How much love is in the ink? <laughs> How much love is in the paper? How much love is in the glue? Zero. So how did you go from feeling grumpy, miserable, whatever, things not going well, to feeling loved when you got that letter? What's going on? How did that happen? Let's analyze that. How did that happen? All right. 
So you see these symbols on here. What does that mean? That says, all right, so I love you. What does I love you mean? <laughs> All right, so, so you associate it with relationship. You associate it with being loved, right? So this, just like the letter that you had and you read, you know that this means I and I means a, right, the, the, a singular for the individual who's speaking, right? That means love, right? A substitute for love. And you have a meaning for love in your mind, right? And this means you, and so it's a personal statement towards you, right? So, so you take what is information. Now, did this make itself? No. What made it? A person, right? A person made it, right? So the information comes from a person. And information can be transferred physically in a physical vehicle, so the ink and the paper can contain information, but you must extract it. And what do you use in the process of extracting? Your toes? your mind, right? You use your mind to extract the information, and when you extract the information, you assign a meaning to it, and the meaning to you means love. And so when you're done with reading the letter, guess what you have? Love, right? So the action that brings in love is thinking. Right? It's thinking, it's a process of thinking, it's a thought process, that interprets information, assigns it the meaning of love, and now you feel love because you brought it in. But information does not come from a non-source. Information always comes from a source. And so the information that you bring in puts you in relationship with the one who brought in, the, who, who originated that information. So, what would happen if you believe people are the source of the love you need? What would that look like? Disappointment. Oh, perfect. She said disappointment sometimes. Right. Sometimes, because, well, all right, I won't go there. <clears throat> Disappointment, yes, yes, exactly. We're going to get deeper into that tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, there's disappointment. Why? Um, have you ever gone to somebody to be your source of oxygen? It's called reverse mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I guess it'd be mouth-to-mouth -mouth desuscitation. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but it would not go well. You get a little bit, and they die. And you got to go find somebody else to desuscitate. That's not a word, is it? Our, our family has a habit of wordizing. That's not a word either, but, you know, you, you get the idea. Um, so, so <clears throat> have you ever gone to somebody to be your source of nutrition? Oh, yeah, what is that? That's cannibalism. Oh, that's horrible. Well, yeah, yeah. But it's not necessarily you. That's, that's something that comes from the outside of you. Because, well, compartments that are inside of you are actually outside of you, like your gut. The inside of your gut is the outside of you. The inside of your, you know, airways is the outside of you. Uh, the inside of those ducts is the outside of you, so yeah, they're actually taking from outside of you. Um, <laughs> I want to get technical. Um, 
So if you use somebody else as your source of nutrition, it's not going to go well. It's called cannibalism. What happens if you make another person your source of love? Is that not cannibalism too? On a whole other level? Yeah, welcome to marriage. All right. Welcome to marriage. Welcome to parenting. Welcome to having parents. Welcome to every other relationship that you and I have experienced. Right? And it's disappointing. It's disappointing. Sometimes. So, everything that functions, everything that functions, functions by law. There's laws that govern the function of everything. And functional laws are unchangeable. They are what they are. I mean, praise God, they are. Because if they were changeable, what would you do with science? I mean, math would be one thing one day and it'd be another thing another day. Of course, I think they're doing that now. But, <laughs> but that's because it's not based on law. It's based on politics and you know other things of that nature, right? But, but how could we ever send somebody off into space if, if every functional law was not law-based and unchangeable? Because you'd never, under, you'd never be able to find anything that you could use that was reliable in order for you to actually be able to do something with it and get something done. God is a God of law. And that means things are predictable and things function in a predictable way. That's good. That's a very good thing. And proper function really is only maintained by staying within the law because once you get outside of the law, then there's dysfunction. Once you break the law, then there's dysfunction. And when we talk about law, there is a fundamental law of all nature. This is fundamental to all natural laws, and that has two pillars to it. The one is that nothing exists from itself. Right? Everything, is everything has needs. Everything is dependent upon material, power, resources, whatever it is, outside of itself in order to exist, in order to function. And the second part of it is that nothing exists for itself. Everything takes in those resources, that power, but it passes it along. Right? And other things then use what's passed along, and there's a chain of taking and giving, taking and giving, taking and giving, taking and giving. The fundamental law of all nature is that everything takes to give. Everything takes to give. That's how everything functions in nature. And from that fundamental law, we get things like thermodynamics. Thermodynamics tells us that all energy necessary for a system to function must come from where? Outside that system. It cannot generate, it's, there is no self-power generating system that can, that can power itself indefinitely in order to do anything. You have to have power that comes from outside of it in order to get the thing going and from outside of it in order to keep the thing going. Unless you had some kind of frictionless system that had no, no loss of energy, but there's always loss of energy, and so on. <clears throat> also from this fundamental law comes the basics of cause and effect. Okay? That tells us that every effect must have a cause because the effect doesn't produce itself. Can't produce itself because the, the power, the resources, the materials, whatever is needed for the effect had to come from where? Outside of it. So there's cause and there's effect. So anywhere that you look at effect, that's not where the cause is. The cause had to be outside of there, and there's always cause and effect. Right? Now this fundamental law of taking to give is the law of life, and welcome to the series. We're going to be looking at this and its applications throughout this coming week, and it has applications everywhere. Yes, it has applications in physical science, but it has applications in mind science too. It has applications in love. It has applications in relationships. It has applications all over the place. And if we don't know it, if we don't understand it, we are going to go fumbling all over ourselves, making a mess, getting disappointed, and all that kind of stuff. But if we understand it, and we learn how to work with it by grace, then 
everything can begin to work the way that was meant to work. Right. So, because everything functions by law, and because effect must follow cause, and cause must produce an effect, therefore, every treatment that takes away or deals with the symptoms, but does not deal with the cause, must produce side effects by law. Every treatment that takes away the symptoms, the manifestation of the problem, but does not really remove the problem itself, must produce side effects because as long as the cause remains, it must manifest its presence by producing effects. And if you take away the current effect, then guess what? Another one. So you have somebody that has a valvular problem in the heart. I'm using an example of a case that I know. And so they're told they need to get that fixed, and so they do, and they have a, they have a, a, a procedure that they go in through the groin, and now they can fix the artery that way, Taver prop, uh, you know, and so they can get a new arterial valve. The new arterial valve goes in, but then they have bleeding complications afterwards, and they put a lot of pressure down here after, they, you know, to get the bleeding under control, and, and, and they hold that pressure for a while, and then the individual uh, then develops third-degree heart block because of the procedure that was done, and now they have to have a pacemaker that's put in, and so the pacemaker's put in, and now they have a, a hernia that develops, and so then they got to get the hernia taken care of. And when they do that and the hernia is taken care of, then they have a the prostate gets problematic and they start having urinary retention. And then they have to get that taken care of. And one train after another after another. And from the healthcare system, we look at it and we go, well, yeah, of course. You have, you know, you have this and then you have complications here and there and so on. But we don't usually think of it from the standpoint of cause and effect. Oh, hang on. You mean we didn't fix the cause? And so it's still there. That's why we're getting effect after effect after effect after effect because we take away that effect and then we take away that effect and then we take away that effect, but the cause is still there so it has to keep manifesting. Hmm. So let's go on a journey. I mean, we're partly on a journey, but we were looking at the trees. Now let's look at the road. So <clears throat> on this road, you have health and things pr uh, function properly and it's comfortable. It's nice, you know, when the road is nice and paved and so on. And there's certain things that you need to remain on the road. You need oxygen, you need water, you need food that we talked about already. You need warmth, uh, you know, a certain temperature in order for things to function the way that they need to. And, and, and once you get off the road, there's dysfunction and it's uncomfortable. There's discomfort as well. And there is always something that defines whether you're on the road or whether you're off the road. Right? There's always a dividing line that tells you whether you're on or whether you're off, and that line is law. It's always law that defines whether you're on the road or whether you're off the road. And does law change? No, it doesn't change. So the road stays the same. That's good. Right? It's a good thing. It's, it's, it's comfortable to have <laughs> boundaries that don't change. Imagine you were going to the uh, Grand Canyon, and there were boundaries, and the boundaries changed every once in a while. And sometimes the boundaries were about 10 feet over the edge. Whoops, Woo. right? That would be a little uncomfortable. Well, at least on the way down. And uh, so, so it's a good thing that boundaries stay where they are, right? And, and by the way, parenting tip, I've got seven children. So <clears throat> boundaries, good things. Consistent boundaries, good things for your children. Because when you have consistent boundaries, they know when they're on the right side and when they're not on the right side. But if your boundaries are always shifting, if you, they, they get away with it now, but they don't get away with it later, they, you know, it's all over the place, it's uncomfortable because you never know when you're gonna hit the boundary. Right? All right, that was a side note. Extra 10 cents worth. All right, so <laughs> what happens if your temperature goes up above the law that governs their, your body temperature? How do you feel? All right, so you, it's uncomfortable. You feel hot, right? So those are symptoms. Those are uncomfortable symptoms. Why do you have uncomfortable symptoms? It's the fire alarm telling you something's wrong so that you can 
do something about it. So when you feel hot, what do you do? Sorry. You fan yourself, you turn the air on, you drink some cold water, you do something of that nature so that you can cool down. And once your temperature gets back down in the confines of the law, you feel comfortable, it's great. You don't have to keep doing all that stuff. What happens if you go in the opposite direction? How do you feel? You feel cold. Is cold comfortable or uncomfortable? It's uncomfortable, right? So you have symptoms again. And the symptoms are there to let you know something's wrong so that you can do something about it. And when you feel cold, what do you do? Yeah, put extra layers on, drink some hot tea, you wrap up and bundle and so on so your temperature can come back up. And once your temperature is within the confines of the law, then you feel comfortable, things are functioning well, you don't have to keep heating up, right? So um, why does it feel one way when you go on this side and it feels another way when you go on this side? What, if, what, what would it be like if when your temperature went down, you got hot? And when your temperature went up, you got hot? Oh, look at that. Yeah, you wouldn't know what to do. Because if you feel hot, you're going to try to cool yourself down. But if you were actually cold when you were feeling hot and you cool yourself down more, well, you just go whoop. And that doesn't end well. And so you could kill yourself trying to do what felt like doing the right thing. Praise God, it hurts differently when you go one way than when you go the other. So that you can know which way to correct. Now you and I, we could care less about law, frankly. I mean, how many of us go around going, oh, well, you know, what's the law of my blood sodium levels? Or what's the law of my, you know, uh, this and that? Yeah, well, we could care less about law. What do we care about? How we feel, that's right. So God in his wisdom has tied the law with our feelings. So that when you get outside, it gets uncomfortable. So you know something's wrong. So that you can do something about it. That's right, to correct it. So what if I don't just stop at symptoms? What if my temperature keeps going up higher? We're gonna, where am I going to get to next? Yeah, yeah we'll eventually get there. Before that, we kind of had disease. So you've got heat exhaustion, heat stroke, things are really bad. It's not only you're just feeling hot. I mean, you are really hot and you're dehydrated and, and you got this bad headache and maybe you're sick to your stomach and things are just really bad. Why? Because now you're really far from the law and you're really in trouble. And if you don't do something really about it now, well, guess what? Yeah, you're going to die. So <clears throat> once you get out here, guess what? You get greater motivation. The farther you go, the greater motivation you get. Because the worse it gets, the farther you get away from the road. And that's to motivate you to fix the cause. Right? To fix the cause. Do something about it. And uh, you get farther out here, you get more drastic in what you're willing to do or submit yourself to in order to get better. So, okay, another point. From a doctor's perspective, and you'll agree with me when I point this out. Um, <clears throat> if you were to draw one line for women and another line for men as to how far you have to get... Oh, way from the road before you'll finally accept help. <laughs> Which line would you draw closer to the road? Yeah, women, right? And where would you draw the, draw, draw the men's line? Uh, yeah, they're just about to death, right? <laughs> I see it all the time in my practice, right? It's almost always women that are coming to the Lifestyle Center. It's always the ones seeing the doctor and, and whatever because they want help and they don't have the pride issue like the men do. And women don't have a prostate. So <laughs> that's another, that's another one too. 
whoever discovered that it was a prostate and you could find it a certain way um, just ruined it for men going to the doctor. <laughs> it's, it's scary. Um, so if your temperature goes the opposite way, well, you might end up with chillblains or frostbite or other things of that nature, very painful because you really need to do something about it right away because if you don't, it's going to fall off. And, and so you've got to warm up. You've got to do something to get back within the confines of the law so that you can have proper function and proper comfort. Now, what happens if we take this concept of the law and the road and now we add chronic symptom care? Now we're going to take care of your symptoms or your symptom complex by giving you medication or herbs or supplements or whatever it is that deals with the symptom. Is that going to work well? No, it's not going to work well. Because let's say that pain is the symptom that we're talking about. And so you're going to take a pill, a pill for the pain. Now here's your road before the pill. Here's your road after the pill, All right? Before the pill, after the pill. Before the pill, after the pill. What's happening to the road? Off. Oh, it appears to get wider, but watch the law. The law doesn't change at all. The edge of the road is still where it is, but it appears to you that the road is wider. Right? It appears that it's wider. So now you can drive into the... Yeah, you can, you can start driving into the ditch and not know that you're driving into the ditch because it still looks like you're on the road. And the stronger the medication, the wider the road. Now, what's the purpose for the symptoms? To alert you that there's a problem so that you'll be motivated to do something about fixing the cause. So if you take symptom management... On a long-term basis, guess what? You take away the motivation to find the cause. And you can move further and further away from the law, not knowing that you're in trouble until eventually, yeah, you're in trouble. So it can be problematic. It can be quite problematic. <clears throat> So if you don't stop at symptoms and disease, you're going to end up at death on either side. And uh, by the way, some symptoms are your rumble strips on the side of the road to let you know something's wrong. You're off the road. And there is this uh, gray zone before death, which I call the point of no return. And that is you're alive. But as we say in the South, you ain't getting back. Right? You're still alive but you are not getting back onto the road, as far, humanly speaking. Now, as far as God's concerned, there's no point in no return. I mean, Lazarus was dead four days, you know. I mean, point of no return is nowhere from God's standpoint. But from a human standpoint, it's true. I've seen it. I've worked in the emergency department. I've had to tell plenty of family members that their loved one died because we were working on them and we couldn't get them back, you know. And, uh, and so I've seen that many times. So there is that, that point. So we don't want to go there. We want to stay here. But who is it that can stay here? Well, only you. No one else can stay there for you. They can stay there for themselves. But only you can stay there for yourself. So we need oxygen. We need water. We need food. We need warmth. What else do we need? Love. Yeah, we need love. Is it possible that there's a law that governs the function of love and that as long as we stay within the confines of that law, there's proper function and it's comfortable, but when we go outside of that law, then there's symptoms, the rumble strips, maybe even disease and death. Possible? Yeah, yeah very much so. So health is proper function, which is the effect of staying within the law, and disease is dysfunction, which is the effect of going outside of the law. And symptoms and disease are the fire alarm. It's the rumble strips. It's good. It's good. Symptoms and disease are not bad. Now, it's bad that you have the symptoms and you have the disease, but the symptoms and the disease are not the bad thing. They're the thing alerting you that there's a 
problem. But the problem is not the symptom. The problem is not the disease. That's just the manifestation of the problem. The problem is deeper. And if we think that the disease is the problem, then what we'll do is treat the manifestation and we'll never go for the cause. And that's a problem. Now, when we speak of cause, then there's a law of cause and effect. And we understand that every effect must have a cause, that every cause must produce an effect, that if the effect is present, then the cause is also present. And if the cause is removed, the effect must go away, right? must go away. Because no effect can produce itself. It is dependent upon power. It's dependent upon material resources outside of itself in order to even function, in order to exist. So you will never find an effect without a cause. You will never find an effect without a cause. That means there is no such thing as chance. Because chance is effect without cause. There's no such thing. Chance is a figment of the imagination. It's a figment of the imagination. There is no such thing as chance. Every effect has a cause. Every effect has a cause. And there is nothing that is truly random. Random is just our inability to predict what will come next. <clears throat> Can God predict what will be next? Yes. There's nothing random. It's just an inability or a, 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 a concept that comes to us because of our inability. The Bible shows this as well. Proverbs 26 and verse 2, the curse causeless shall not come. Right? You will never have, a cause, another, never have a curse or an effect without a cause. And we're also told in the laws of God and nature, effect follow, follows cause with unerring certainty. Ooh. And the will of God establishes a connection between cause and effects. I would love to park here for a little while and just tease this one out, but I don't have time. But I'll just summarize it this way. God is responsible for the effects. God is responsible for the effects. He's not responsible for the cause. But the effects are there to help fix the cause. Right? To help fix the cause. <clears throat> so when you have a broken law, what is it that we call law breaking? Okay, sin. And when we talk about sin, which law are we talking about being broken? All right, Ten Commandments, God's law. And what is the foundation of God's law? It's love. Right? So, pay attention. <clears throat> Disease is the result of a love problem. <clears throat> Disease is the result of a love problem. There is a divinely appointed connection between sin and disease. A what kind of appointed connection? Divinely, because God is the one that is in control of, of effects. There is a divinely appointed connection between sin and disease. No physician can practice for a month without seeing this illustrated. If he will be observing and honest, he cannot help acknowledging that sin and disease bear to each other the relationship of cause and effect. It's true. I see it all the time. Now let's get tiny cells. You and I have 50 to 100 trillion cells in our body. We have over 250 different types of cells. And each cell has a different set of functions that are specific. There are certain functions that are specific to that specific type of cell. Of course, if that wasn't the case, then you wouldn't have different types. The different types have different functions. And cells are kind of like little factories if we simplify it. And factories, of course, will produce a product or products. And so the products and the functions that you have as a body, as a whole, are dependent upon the products and functions of the individual cells and cell types that you have in the body. And if you lose a particular cell type, you lose that function as a whole in the body. Right? For example, like type 1 diabetes. You have an individual that initially had beta islet cells in the pancreas and plenty of them in order to produce what? 
Insulin, the only cells in the body that produce insulin. And so now you have a process that comes along that destroys those beta islet cells. And when you do not have beta islet cells anymore, guess what you can't produce? Insulin. And guess what happens? Yeah, type 1 diabetic. And if we did not have insulin to give you, you would die. And back in the day, it was one of the worst diagnoses to get, was type 1 diabetes because you would be dead within hours to a few weeks of that diagnosis. So it was worse than being diagnosed with cancer. Praise God, there's insulin that we can manufacture or extract and, and use, and people can live for decades without naturally or natively producing insulin. They can take it exogenously or through injection. So <clears throat> when you have something that comes along that starts destroying the body or destroying parts of the body, you have, you have a cause that is in place, and, and immediately once you have the cause in place, the effect will begin. Right? Once you have a cause, immediately the effect will begin. But it may take time for the effect to get big enough in order for you to be able to notice it. For example, if you had, and I don't know how many you had, but if you had 20 billion beta islet cells, it could take time to go through those 20 billion beta islet cells until you didn't have any. Now, it's generally assumed that you have to lose about half of a cell population before you really start manifesting problems associated with that deficiency. And so if that was the case, you would need to lose about 10 billion beta islet cells in order for you to begin manifesting symptoms of type 1 diabetes. So let's say that you had a process that began now, and, and, and now you're killing off 100 cells every second. So 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. It keeps along at that rate. Now, biological things don't continue at just a single rate, but we're just using this as a thought experiment. So, and, and so what are you going to lose? You're going to lose 6,000 cells a minute, three, uh, 360,000 cells an hour, 8.6 million cells in a day, 16.5 million cells in a week, 260 million cells in a month, and 3.2 billion cells in a year. It will take you three years and two months of that process being in place for the cause being in place before you notice the effect. But the entire time, the cause was there. Now, the next slide is a really important one. <clears throat> uh, oh, no, the one after this, sorry. Some disease processes are faster, other ones are slower. Some, it might just be seconds, minutes, or hours between the cause being in place and you manifesting the effect. Or other ones might be years or even decades. Like type 2 diabetes, it's usually in place for at least 10 years before somebody starts really manifesting problems with it. So this is the slide that's really important. And that is, do you want to know the cause? Yes, we want to know the cause because you want to remove the cause because the only way you can truly have a cure is for the cause to be removed. So how do you understand the cause when you're looking for the cause? Well, it must meet these criteria. The cause must be in place before the effect was ever first noticed. So when I'm sitting down with somebody and they're having health challenges, which is, you know, I mean, that's what I do. My first question is, when did it begin? When was your first symptom? Because that tells me the cause had to be in place by that time or earlier. And also, if the effect is still present and the effect is a process, if the effect is a process, which all diseases are, if the effect is a process, and then that, and, the, and it's still present, then the cause is also present. Right? If, the, if the process, the effect is still there, then that means the cause is still there. So when you're looking for the cause, you're looking for something in your life that was there before you had the first symptom, and that's still there now. It's got to meet those criteria, otherwise it's not the cause. Right? So that's what you're looking for. And if the cause is removed, then the effect must begin to go away. Now, it might have been a time of developing, and so it might be a time of regressing. Right? It's not like it just goes, boom, gone. But it should begin that process of regression once the cause is removed. Right? So every cell functions by the law of life. 
of taking to give. And the cells are dependent upon resources. They're dependent upon power outside of themselves in order to function. And the resources, like fuel, and the power, like the spark plug, any engine that functions, it has to have fuel that it functions by, and it has to have something to ignite the fuel. You can have the fuel, and if you have no ignition, you've got nothing. And if you have ignition, but you have no fuel, you've got nothing. You've got to have both in order for the thing to function. And it's the cell's own responsibility to pull in the resources and to pull in the power that they need in order to function, but they don't keep it to themselves because the law says everything takes to give, right? So they produce things. So cells will take in things in order to produce stuff and pass it along, just like everything else in creation. Hormones, insulin, glucagon, so on. And the fuel, the raw materials for the cells, include things that we talked about. Oxygen, water, nutrients. It's chemicals, right? The fuel for the cells are chemicals. And those chemicals are brought in by the cells, and they're put out by the cells. And so the, 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 the cells end up being chemical factories. And everything that you need, of course, must be brought in from outside of you, and those things come in from outside in the environment, and they're brought in through an organ or an organ system. So example, oxygen. Oxygen's going to be brought in through the respiratory tract. And how many cells of your body need oxygen? All of them. So how are you going to get them from nose to toes? All right. So everywhere needs it, and so you've got to have the circulatory system. So you have the blood. The blood is the semi-truck that carries the payload of oxygen to the various different parts of the body so that each cell that you want to live can live. And of course, the Bible tells us in Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Why? That's because the blood carries the raw materials, the sources that are necessary for the cells to function. And if you impede that circulation in any way, then there's going to be negative effects associated with that. So some of you have probably heard the term, perfect health is dependent upon perfect circulation. Right? So you've got to have good circulation because you've got to get the raw materials to the different parts of the body for them to function well. Now, you need everything that you need, and the cells need what they need, but they need them in certain concentrations and quantities. And so if it's in a good concentration or quantity, the cell can extract what it needs. If it's too little or if it's too much, you're going to end up with dysfunction. Now, not only do the cells need resources or chemicals or fuel, the cells also need energy or power. And the cells function as electrical units, regulating positively and negatively charged particles inside and outside of the cell with resultant voltage and current and resistance. These are all electrical terms, electrical properties. Cells function as electrical units. It's not the nucleus that drives the function of the cell. It's the membrane that drives the function of the cell. The nucleus is there in order to be the blueprints to build the products that are necessary. And of course, if you take the nucleus out, then you can't make the blueprint, you know, you don't have the blueprints and you can't make the, the, the new resources that are necessary. But it's, the, it's the, the membrane that really drives the function of the cell and it's electrically driven, but you have chemicals that are involved in it as well. Now, how many cells need power? All of them. And where is the power going to come from, inside or outside? Outside, that's right. And how many of the cells need to be coordinated in their function? All of them. So what is it that's going to power and coordinate the function of the cells in the body? The brain, <clears throat> the central nervous system. Right? The functions of the body are regulated through the central nervous system, and there is power that comes through that pathway. It allows the nervous system to control and regulate the system. Now, where does the nervous system get the power from? Inside itself or outside of itself? Outside of itself. The, where does it get the spark to ignite the fuel? Now, the fuel is the, the, the food, right? The chemicals, right? 
So it's not glucose that ignites glucose. What is it that ignites it? That comes from outside of it. In order, uh, it's not the food. The food is the, how, what is it that's going to ignite the food in order to get it going? Where the power has to come from outside of it. Remember, every system that functions, the, the energy necessary for that system, system to function must come from outside that system. Hmm. No, uh -huh. okay. <clears throat> it comes from information. Information. Spiritual information. You and I live by information. Now, we live by food too. But man does not live by bread alone, but by every, what's words? information, spiritual information, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? So it's by spiritual information that the power is made available to the cortex, which then can control through the nerves and the endocrine system and so on, every other cell and its function in the body. <clears throat> so the cells are not just physical. I mean, our, our selves are not just physical. We're spiritual as well. And we have a spirit, too. We're told in Genesis 2 and verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being, a living soul. So there was dust and breath and a living being. The dust becomes the body, the breath becomes the spirit, and the living being is the soul. So you and I, we function somewhat like a computer. It's a rough analogy, um, <clears throat> but we function somewhat like a computer. You have software and you have hardware. If you just have software, do you have anything? No. If you just have hardware, does anything function? No. You've got to have the two together in order for you to have any function. Now, when you bring hardware and software together, does software cease being software and hardware cease being so hardware? No, they each retain their individual essential qualities, but there is no function until you bring the two together. Right? There's no function if they're separate. Same thing with you and I. We have a body and we have a spirit. And the body and the spirit, you only function when the two are together. But when the two come together, the spirit doesn't stop being the spirit and the body doesn't stop being the body. And they don't stop having their individual components of that function, but there is no function unless they are together. That's right. <clears throat> and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In creation, I'm not talking just about creation of man, but creation as a whole. In creation, which came first? The physical or the spiritual? Okay, so who created? God did. What do we know about God? Well, we know Jesus said God is spirit. He should know. And in creation, God spoke, and it was. Right? He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be a firmament, and there was a firmament. He said, let there be land, and there was land, and so on. Right? He spoke, and it came into existence. And Jesus, who was the word made flesh, he said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life so from the spiritual comes everything that's physical from God whose spirit comes everything that's physical now science doesn't particularly like this idea because it looks at everything from the other side the other perspective science says that everything spiritual is an effect of physical Creation shows us that everything physical is an effect of that which is spiritual. So science will look at the physical as the problem and the solution. Welcome to our world. Creation will show us that the physical is only the manifestation of that which is spiritual. And if you want to find the solution, you've got to go hunting for the spiritual because that's really the foundation. 
So we were created in God's image, and so in us, it's the spiritual that's first, that which then drives or impacts the physical. So the spirit takes in spiritual information. That's made available to the cortex, which generates electrical currents, action potentials. That's transmitted down the nerves and to the different uh, endocrine system. That releases chemicals that the cells take in. And taking that in, it regulates then the function, upregulating, downregulating, starting new processes, ending new, ending new processes, and so on. And thus, by that pathway, you regulate everything that happens and functions in your body. <clears throat> and um, that is the soul that thinks. It's not the brain that thinks. But if you didn't have a brain, you couldn't think. It's the hardware, right? Um, but if you, didn't, if you had the brain, but you didn't have the spirit, well, you'd have no thinking either. You've got to have both. You have to have both. That's the mind. Right? The mind is not just the brain. The mind is the brain and the spirit together. And that's that that can think, right? And God said, let us create man in our own image according to our likeness. So he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. And God is the author of truth. He is the God of truth. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. And he created us in his image. So what kind of information do we function by? truth. We function by truth. And when truth is the basis of the information that you and I take in, then through that pathway, everything functions the way that it's supposed to. And we end up with proper function. But when it is error or lies that we take in, then through that same pathway, we end up with dysfunction. So is it important what you believe? Yes. Because it will have manifestations, not only mentally, but it will have manifestations physically as well. <clears throat> That a lot to digest? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I won't go on from here. Tomorrow night, we'll start looking at the different causes of dysfunction. This is not the only cause. Right? There's other ways that you can dysfunction. But this is a huge pathway, and it's one that many people have not understood. So we have not understood the impact of one's thoughts and one's beliefs on one's physical health. And because of that, we have eaten our veggies and um, our veggie hot dogs and our other things and gone on our veggie walks and done all those kinds of things. And we still end up with uh, very real non-veggie diseases because we might have tried to get the physical things under control, but the things up here have run rampant and it has its effect. It has its effect. And so we're going to dive deeper tomorrow. Um, we're going to hit the rabbit hole. We're going to cover this stuff, the, the different causes of dysfunction. I guarantee you this will, I mean, it's logical. You, you just look at it and you go, oh, okay, well, yeah, why didn't I think of that before? How come everybody doesn't think that way? Uh, it, it'll be very, very, it's like, duh, <laughs> very logical. <clears throat> And it will help us to tease through, uh, is the cause a, a mind issue or is it something else? And then we're going to, we're going to look at worldviews, why we have worldviews that we do, how do we measure things, how do we assess things, how do we assess whether something is right or not, and, and so on. And uh, we're going to head down the rabbit hole. And then Tuesday, well, hang on, let's see, that's... Sunday. All right, Monday. Uh, then Monday, we're going to get even deeper. And Tuesday, we're going to get to probably the depth that we're going to go to. Um, and it'll be fairly dark by the time we hit Tuesday. I, I guarantee you, this is going to be challenging. But that's where we turn the corner. 
and then we're going to start hitting the light. And I guarantee you the rest of the week, it's going to grow brighter and brighter and be absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs>